Hello YouTube and today I would like to give you an introduction to Mathematica. Mathematica is a piece of software that I use basically every single day as part of my work in theoretical physics and I'd like to give you a short tutorial on some of the basic functionality of Mathematica. Lots of you will be familiar with languages like MATLAB and Python and C and all of these are numerical packages. They solve equations in terms of numerical answers whereas Mathematica is symbolic which is known as a computer algebra system and rather than evaluating expressions to give you a number it'll evaluate expressions to give you an algebraic symbolic answer. Mathematica has very powerful features for the manipulation of algebraic expressions. It can solve equations in algebraic form rather than just give numerical results but it can do numerical results too, no problem. It has an enormous library of algebraic solutions to integrals so you'll never need a book of integral tables again it's all built into Mathematica, so you give it an integral, it'll look it up for you in its extensive database. It can solve systems of differential equations, can handle linear algebra, has some very nice visualization uh, technologies. It can do arbitrary precision arithmetic. In other words, when you do get a result that you want um, worked out uh, numerically, you can specify an arbitrary number of digits and get your answer to an arbitrary precision. So if you have an irrational number, for example, and you want to know it to 1,000 decimal places, that's not a problem. Mathematica can handle that to arbitrary precision. It has lots of the normal programming language features that we'd expect, like functions and flow control. There are lots of built-in specialized toolboxes, which I won't cover today, but there are built-in toolboxes for wavelets, signal processing, systems modeling, volumetric imaging, financial analysis, and even social media analysis. And there are also lots of other free packages available online to extend Mathematica's functionality. Uh, also, based on Mathematica, Wolfram recently announced the Wolfram language, which is a, a programming language designed to be integrated into embedded systems with Mathematica-like capabilities. So in the future, you might be able to build robots or embedded devices that use Mathematica to power it. There's a very great uh, documentation center where you can look up the uh, the meaning of all of the different functions and how to use them. And uh, as a final note, lots of the functionality that we're going to discuss with Mathematica is built into Wolfram Alpha. Those of you who don't know Wolfram Alpha, it's a computational knowledge engine which is freely available online and it uses Mathematica as a back end. So this tutorial won't just teach you about Mathematica but hopefully you should be a more competent user of Wolfram Alpha once you understand a bit about how the Mathematica backend works. Also, Wolfram recently introduced the CDF or Computable Document Format. This is a document format for embedding uh, computations into a document. So, for example, if you uh, want to share a document with a student rather than giving them a PDF with text in it, you can give them some interactive mathematics you can drag sliders around and interact with the mathematical equations and that's called the computable document format which, uh, which is based on Mathematica as well. So here's a summary of what we're going to talk about today. We'll have a look at entering symbols, simple algebraic manipulation, solving systems of equations, complex numbers, mm -hmm. linear algebra, how to define functions, basic visualization using plotting, then we'll have a look at calculus, both derivatives and integrals, and solving systems of differential equations. We'll have a look at sums, entering equations using the palette, because Mathematica lets you do enter things in two ways. You can either ent enter them using text, or you can implement them graphically using a palette, which we'll have a look at. It has uh, flow control, we'll have a look at that. We'll have a look at interactive graphics, so that you can give a Mathematica document to someone and they can interact with your data by sliding sliders around and that kind of thing. We'll have a look at how to export Mathematica data into other formats. And then we'll finish off with three uh, fairly simple little programming exercises that will summarize uh, and use some of the functionality that we've discussed in the tutorial. So let's get started and have a look at entering symbols. I'll open this up. So, to enter the complex number i, we type in escape and then ii and then escape. To enter a square root, you type control 2. To enter the irrational number e, you type escape, ee, -E, escape. To enter a power, you type the number and then press control 6 and then the number that you're raising the power to. To enter a fraction, you type control forward slash. 
To evaluate an expression, you don't press return, you press shift return. Just return will take you to a new line, shift return will evaluate the expression. So, um, and uh, the percentage symbol is used as an alias for the last output expression. So here I've got some simple expressions that I've entered. A equals 3 plus 2i, b is the square root of 2, c is e to the 1.5, d is this fraction, uh, and then I'll sum them all up. And then the sum, we add 2 to it. So let's evaluate that. I'll press shift return, and here are the answers that we get. Uh, it returns a, the 3 plus 2i, the root 2, uh, e to the 1.5, it's evaluating that numerically because this is a numerical number, not a symbolic number. Uh, this is the same fraction, just expressed a little bit differently. Uh, here I've added them all up, and here I've added 2 to it using this placeholder that this is the alias for the, for the previous expression. So that's how you enter some basic expressions. And now we're going to have a look at how to do some basic algebraic manipulation uh, using Mathematica. So, uh, in Mathematica, all functions are called using square brackets. In most languages you're familiar with, normal brackets are used uh, to, to define arguments passed to a function. In Mathematica, you use square brackets because normal brackets are treated as an algebraic bracket. So, here we can define a variable y equals x squared. I'll shift return that, and it just returns x squared. Now we're going to take the expression x squared plus sine x and make the substitution that x is equal to b squared plus c. So here I've got the expression x squared plus sine x. This here, this uh, slash dot, means make a substitution. And then this expression here means make the substitution x becomes y squared plus z. So if I evaluate this expression, it should take this first part, make the substitution x equals y squared plus z into this expression. Let's run that with shift enter and uh, there we get our symbolic expression for what that looks like. We can uh, convert between trigonometric and exponential forms for algebraic expressions. As you know, any exponential can be written in terms of trigonometric functions and vice versa. So Mathematic has some built-in functions trig to exp and exp to trig. So we'll try converting the trigonometric expression sine of x to exponential form and the exponential function x of x to trigonometric form. And here it gives us the answers that you're probably all familiar with in terms of hyperbolic trigonometric functions or in terms of exponentials. The expand function is used to expand parentheses. So here I've got x plus 1 times x minus 1. We're going to expand that. As you know, that should give us x squared minus 1. I'll run that, and sure enough, that's the answer I get. Mathematica has a function called simplify, which is used to simplify mathematical expressions, as the name suggests. So it'll do things like uh, cancellations and grouping common terms together to simplify the expression. So here I've got a simple expression. You can see that I've got a 2x squared there and an x squared there. So that should simplify down. There we go, simplifies down. We had the expand uh, function before. The factor function does exactly the opposite. So x squared minus 1 factors into x plus 1 times x minus 1. So that will give me that answer. Here's an example of arbitrary precision arithmetic. You use the n function, which means evaluate. You type in what you want to evaluate. I'm evaluating pi. I'm going to evaluate it to 100 decimal places. Run that. Boom. There's pi to 100 decimal places. I can make it 1,000 decimal places if I want. No problem. It can handle arbitrary precision very efficiently. Now I'm going to define this polynomial here. It's got some x squared, some x cubes, a constant, and a sine x. There it is. And the coefficient function will allow me to extract, extract the coefficients of different terms in a polynomial. So here I call coefficient, act on the polynomial, and extract the coefficient from front of x squared, or in front of x cubed, or in front of sine of x. So let's run all of those and you'll see that the coefficient in front of x squared is 3, which it is. The coefficient in front of x cubed is 5, which it is. And the coefficient in front of sine of x is 6, which it is. So that's what the coefficient function does. Now we're going to have a look at solving some, uh, some simple equations. Uh, so Mathematica has a function called solve. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to give it the equation z equals x squared plus 1. 
and we're going to solve it for x. So to do that we type in this. This is our expression that we want to solve. Note that we use a double equals sign, not a single equal sign. A single equal sign does an assignment. We want to do a logical comparison. So z double equals x squared plus 1 and we're solving it for x. And there we get our results. Notice that there are two results because it involves a square root, the plus and the minus square root. So we get a list with both of the answers. The first answer is minus the square root of z minus 1. The second answer is plus the square root of z minus 1. So Mathematica will give us all of the algebraic solutions. We can also solve systems of equations using the same function. So we're going to solve this system of equations here. x plus y plus z equals 1 and x minus y equals 2. These are a coupled system of equations. We've got some of the same parameters in both. So we use the solve equation again. We type in our two equations. We use the double ampersand to separate the different equations in the system. And then we use the list, which is the curly brackets, to specify all the variables that we want to solve for. So let's solve that. Oops. Um, uh, I have a problem here. I've previously defined the, 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 the variable x. This is a problem in Mathematica. If you redefine a value, sometimes you, you get problems. So I just quit the kernel just then. That clears all the values. So if I run this again now, now it shouldn't give me a, a problem. Uh, that's a common trick that you need to remember in Mathematica. If you define a variable and forget about it and use it later on, uh, you might need to quit the kernel to remove uh, the assignment to that variable. So that's what I've just done. And now it's telling us that the solution to that equation is y is equal to x minus 2 and z is equal to 3 minus 2x. And you can use an arbitrarily large system of equations for an arbitrarily large number of parameters and it'll give you the solution to the si simultaneous system of equations. Let's have a look at complex numbers. So uh, the complex number i, as I said at the beginning, is entered as escape I, I, escape, or just as a capital I, they both work. So here I'm saying z is equal to 3 plus 2i. And now we're going to do a few things. We're going to take z squared, the absolute value of z, the argument of z, the complex conjugate of z, and the imaginary and real components of z. So that's how we do it. z squared, absolute value of z, argument of z, conjugate of z, imaginary component of z, and real component of z. Let's uh, run that, and boom, there we get them. z squared is 5 plus 12i. Absolute value of z is root 13. Notice that uh, it's irrational. It gives us the irrational forms, so this is an exact answer. Simil similarly with the argument of z, it's an irrational number, so it gives us the exact analytic form, which is the arctan of two-thirds. The conjugate, just flipping the sign on the minus term, and the coefficients in front of the real and imaginary components. So Mathematica handles complex numbers very nicely and it does everything analytically. We don't just get numerical answers, we get exact symbolic forms. Next we'll move on to linear algebra. So we're going to define a 2x2 two two matrix called A with elements 1, 2, 3 and 4 and a two-element vector v with elements v1 and v2, where v1 and v2 are left as variables, whereas the 1, 2, and 3, and 4 are actual numbers. So we do that like this. To make a matrix, we use nested curly brackets. This is the top row, this is the bottom row, and the vector, it's just a, a, a normal list. We'll run that. Now we've got our matrix and our vector. We can, this isn't really very elegant to look at, so Mathematica has this thing called matrix form, ended like this, and that'll display it in a nice human readable form like that. And now what we're going to do is multiply the matrix A by the vector V, and to do that you use the full stop operator, not the star operator. The star operator does element-wise multiplication if you're doing vectors or matrices, the dot operator does a, uh, a linear algebra multiplication. So we're going to do a dot v, uh, take the answer that we got and put it in matrix form. And so there's our answer. Uh, it's a vector with v1 plus 2v2. That's the top row of the matrix multiplied. And the bottom row is 3v1 plus 4v2, which is the bottom row of the matrix times that vector. 
Uh, so, so that's how we do basic uh, matrix vector operations. Now for that matrix, we're going to do a few different matrix operations. We're going to calculate the determinant, the inverse, the matrix square, the element-wise square, those are different things, matrix square and element-wise square, the transpose, calculate the eigenvalues, we're going to take the Kronecker product, that's useful in quantum physics in particular, which I use very extensively, and we're going to have a look at extracting some elements from, from the answer. So, here's our matrix, here's the determinant of the matrix, det A, here's the inverse, written in matrix form, Here's the matrix power, so it's A to the power of 2, using a matrix form. Here's the element-wise square, so if we just use A squared, that doesn't do the matrix power, that does the element-wise square, so every element is squared. Here we've got the transpose, here we've got the eigenvalues, so there are two eigenvalues, again they're in exact analytic form with the irrational numbers represented irrationally. And here we've got the Kronecker product of A tensor A. And that'll give us a 4x4 uh, a four four matrix now, because we're doing a Kronecker product of two 2x2 two two matrices. To extract the first uh, column of the matrix, we do A double left square bracket, 1 double right square bracket, that'll extract the first row. And if we want to extract a particular element, we do the same thing but separate by commas. So this will extract the bottom right element, the 2, 2 element. There it is, 4. Okay, so those are some basic matrix operations. We can also use the table function to automatically generate matrices. So we're going to make a 10 by 10 matrix. It's a bit tedious to do it by hand, so we're going to use the table function to automatically make the 10 by 10 matrix and populate it with a formula. We use the table function like this, n is our matrix, it's equal to the table. Uh, this is the formula that we're going to populate it with, where i and j are the rows and the columns. Here we specify that i goes over the range 1 to 10, j goes over the range 1 to 10, so it's a 10 by 10 matrix, and every element is going to be i times j plus the sign of i plus j. Then we're going to print that in matrix form. And here we get it in nice analytic form. Our full 10 by 10 matrix. Everything's analytic. The signs aren't evaluated to numbers. They're represented exactly using the analytic expressions. And that's how we can automatically generate very, very large matrices. Um, it's no problem at all to automatically generate matrices that are thousands of elements in size and do LR matrix operations on them. So that's a simple introduction to linear algebra in Mathematica. The next thing we're going to have a look at is functions. No programming language is complete without functions. You're going to have to define your own. So we're going to define a function f acting on a variable x that implements the function f of x is equal to cos x plus sine x and define another function g of x is equal to cos of x minus 2. Now when we define functions, we do it like this. You, the name of the function, f, square brackets, remember all functions are called with spare brackets. Inside we pass the, uh, the names of the variables that are passed to the function. Each one is separated by a comma, and each variable is followed by an underscore. That indicates that it's a variable being passed to a function. Then we use colon equals to show that it's an assignment of a function, and then we've just got the equation. So that gives us two functions, I'll run that. And now we can evaluate the function f for x equals 1 just by calling f of 1 with square brackets. And there we get cos of 1 plus sine of 1. Easy. This is in exact analytic form. So now let's have a look if we can evaluate this expression to five decimal places. We use the n function that we used before. We we'll pass f of 1 to it, evaluate it to five decimal places, run that, boom. If we did it to 50 decimal places, boom. If we did it to 500 decimal places, boom. No problem. But if we do it without the n function, it'll just give us the exact analytic expression, which has perfect precision, because it's handled analytically. So now we're going to define a function of two variables called h. Its variables are x and y, and it implements sine of x plus cos of y. So this is how we do it here, h of x underscore comma y underscore 
colon equals and then the equation. I'll just run that. You don't see any output. Uh, and now we're going to evaluate it for x equals 1, y equals 2. So we just call h of 1 and 2. And there we get it. Cos of 2 plus sine of 1. You can evaluate that uh, numerically. You can use the n function or you can use backslash backslash n as well. There we go. There's the analytic, there's the numeric form. Let's go back to the analytic form. There we go. Okay, so to test out uh, this with something a little bit more useful, we're going to write a function called av. that calculates the average of the elements in a list v, and then we're going to evaluate it to find the average of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So here I've made a vector called data, which is a list, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Lists are denoted with the curly brackets, in numbers separated by commas. And I'm going to show you two ways to, to define this function. I'll call them av1 and av2. So in both cases, we pass a vector v. This is our assignment. And this first one, we implement the sum going from i equals 1 to the length of the vector. Uh, take the ith element of the vector, and then we normalize it by the number of elements in the vector. The other way to do it is using an inbuilt function in Mathematica called total, which sums up all of the elements in a vector. So we sum up all the elements in the vector, divided by the length of the vector, and that gives us the average as well. So we'll, we'll test out both of those. Whoops. And they both give the same answer, which is 3. That's the average of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So there's a simple example. You're probably wondering how I entered this fancy sum expression here. The way to do that is using this palette uh, in Mathematica that lets you enter things visually. You can do integrals and sums and all sorts of things visually. You can do pretty much everything visually. Uh, but we're going to come back to that a little bit later on, and I'll show you explicitly how to do that graphically. But there is also another function in Mathematica called sum, so you can implement this function using text as well. Okay, so let's have a look at plotting. Graphics are really important in any mathematical um, software. So we're going to plot the function sine of x in the range x is between 0 and 5. We use the plot function, the function that we're plotting, and then in curly brackets, the name of the variable, the independent variable, and the range. It goes from 0 to 10. Oh, I lied. I said 0 to 5. Let's make it 0 to 10. Um, let's run that. And there we get our nice plot of sine of x in the range 0 to 10. Okay, now we're going to superimpose some plots. Let's superimpose sine and cos. So we use exactly the same function as before in the plot command. We want to specify multiple functions. So we specify them as a list using curly brackets with the individual functions separated by commas. Run that. And it superimposes sine x and cos x over the range 0 to 10. We can also do three-dimensional plots. So now we're going to plot the function sine of x times cos of y over the range x and y between 0 and 5. So we use the function plot3d, the name of the function, the, the function that we're evaluating, which is sine of x times cos of y, and then in curly brackets, the range of the first variable, and then comma, range of the second variable. So x and y go from 0 to 5, and we're plotting sine of x times cos of y. Let's run that. And there we get our nice three-dimensional plot. Now, we can just directly graphically manipulate this using the mouse. If I just drag this plot around, I can view it from all sorts of different angles. There are also ways that you can specify manually as part of the function, uh, as part of the plot3d function. You can specify viewing angles and stuff, but usually it's easier just to drag things around. There are lots of options available to these plotting functions, which I'm not going to go into, that allow you to specify color schemes and the, the width of the... Um, of the lines and whether there's a mesh you can turn off these black lines and just get the nice colored component uh, There are all sorts of different things you can do you can add transparency so that you have translucency in your 3d plot Lots of options if you want to do that just explore the documentation center if I go to help menu documentation center Let me bring that up. Here's the documentation center. I can type in plot 3d There we are Let's have a look at the plot3d function. Gives us a few examples, tells us how to use the function. If we scroll down, it gives us some examples. 
and uh, you can have a look at options and you know, all these different things that you can manipulate colors and axis labels. You can add labels to the axes and the plot ranges and all sorts of stuff. So if you want to fiddle around with your plots to make them look nice for your next science paper, just have a look through all the options in the help center. Okay, now we're going to add, have the same plot and add some axis labels to them. So the, the function is exactly the same, but at the end we add a comma and then we add the command axis label goes to this goes to this right arrow is implemented as a as a dash and then a right arrow and then when you press the space bar it turns it into a right arrow that's how you enter that and then in curly brackets the name of each of the um, axes uh, in, in uh, double quotation marks so let's run that and now we've got X Y and Z axes there are other options that let you change the font size so here we're going to disable the mesh. Uh, so we've got uh, mesh goes to none, turns off the black lines. Uh, this option here, base style font size, that changes the, the size of the font on the axes. Uh, again, I can turn it around. There are other options to do translucency and stuff. So there's lots of stuff you can do. Another way of plotting, uh, visualizing a 3D function is using a density plot. The syntax is exactly the same, it's just that I replace plot 3D with density plot. Let's run that. Here I've got a nice top-down uh, uh, density plot of that function. It shows exactly the same data. In fact, if I look at it from above, you can probably see that they look kind of similar. They sort of do, but they have different color schemes. Uh, the last uh, plotting that I want to show you is parametric plots. These are kind of useful sometimes. So imagine that we want to plot in 3D. Uh, the following system of equations. X is equal to cos of t, Y is equal to sine of t, and Z is equal to t, where X, Y, and Z are the three axes in our plot. Uh, if you think about it, I'm sure you can convince yourself very simply that this uh, is a corkscrew. The X and Y plane is just spinning around, parametrized by t, and the Z is increasing linearly, so this will give us a corkscrew. So we use parametric plot 3D, in curly brackets, we've got the list of parameters, of functions. The first function is the x-axis, which is cos of t. The second function is the y-axis, which is sine of t. The third function is the z-axis, which is t. And we're specifying that t is going from 0 to 4 pi. Let's run that. Okay, there we go. There's our nice corkscrew. And you can use all the normal functions to manipulate uh, font sizes and axis labels and we can drag it around using the mouse to, see, mouse to see our corkscrew from all sorts of different angles. So that's parametric plots. Mathematic has many many other plotting functions. You can do list plots and histograms and all sorts of stuff. These are just some of the basic ones that I've looked at. Now I'd like to have a look at calculus, uh, derivatives and integrals. So we can take, analytically take the derivative of a function using the d function and you specify the function that you want to take the derivative of and what the variable is with respect to which you're taking the, uh, the, the differentiation. So let's run that. Sine of x, derivative is cos of x. No surprises there. Now I'm going to take the indefinite integral of this result. So the, the uh, percentage sign just means take this last result, which was the cos of x. So we're going to integrate cos of x with respect to x, and we get back sine of x. No surprises there. I could have also just directly typed in uh, sine of x there. Give me the same result. Okay. Uh, we can also take a definite integral, which is over a particular range. So here we use the n integrate. This is numerical integrate, so I'm going to take the numerical integral of cos of x for x goes to 0 to 5. So this will not give me a symbolic answer, this will give me a numerical answer. Run that, and there's the answer to that integral. We can also use Mathematica to solve systems of differential equations. Uh, so let's start with a simple one. Here's a simple differential equation. 2 times the derivative of y with respect to x plus 3 times of y of x plus cos of x is equal to x. And we're going to solve that using this uh, command here. It's called dsolve, differential solve. We simply enter in the equation that we want to solve 
We use this prime symbol, just the apostrophe, to represent the derivative. We use the double, inter double equals, as usual, for solving a, a system of equations. We specify the function that we want to solve for, which is y of x, and what the independent variable is, x. So this will solve this equation here for y of x, where x is the independent variable. So let's run that. And this is our analytic result. Again, it's an analytic result. It's exact in terms of analytic expressions. You'll notice one thing. There's this funny C1 here. That is an unspecified constant. And the reason we have an unspecified constant is because we've solved a differential equation without boundary conditions. And without boundary conditions in a differential equation, in general, there are going to be some unknown constants. So it is possible to specify boundary conditions. We could have done that, but I've done it without boundary conditions. So all this is telling me is that this is the general analytic form to the solution of this differential equation, but there's an unknown constant, and the answer to that constant is going to depend on what the boundary condition is, which I haven't specified. So this is a very general analytic result, and we can, uh, if we want, we can plug in the boundary conditions to, to get rid of that unknown constant. That was for a single equation. We can also do systems of equations. Here I've got a system of equations. Uh, the derivative of y1 of x is equal to y2 of x, and the derivative of y2 of x plus 3 is equal to y1 of x. So now we've got two coupled system of equations. The first system of equations depends on the second system, and the second system depends on the first system. So it's a coupled system of differential equations. The only difference is we use the same function. We specify the system of equations in curly brackets with each equation separated by a comma. Again, double equals in the assignment, prime to represent the derivative. In curly brackets, we specify what both of the functions that we're solving for are, and y1 and y2 in this case, and again, the independent variable is x. So let's run that, and here I get it. It's telling us that y1 of x is equal to uh, this big mess of a thing here. Notice that we've got some c1s and some c2s in here. So there are two uh, unspecified constants in the general solution, and the y2 of x is equal to this big mess here. Again, we've got some unspecified constants, C1 and C2, but you'll notice that, as always with Mathematica, everything is in analytic form in terms of exponentials and exact fractions. There's nothing numeric in here, so this is all an exact result, which is really, really beautiful. Let's have a look at sums. Uh, there's just a uh, command called sum. You specify what you're summing over and the range. So here I'm summing over i squared for i in the range 1 to n. And uh, now if I said uh, sum this for 1 to 10, it would give me a numerical result. But because I haven't specified what the n is, uh, it doesn't give me a numerical result. Watch what happens when I run it. It gives me an exact analytic solution for the general sum of i squared uh, ranging from i equals 1 to n in terms of n. So I get a, a beautiful analytic expression in terms of n, and then I can substitute in whatever I want. If I, sub if I put in a 10 there to give me an exact uh, uh, number, uh, but I can leave it in terms of unspecified variables, and it will still use its big database of, of lookup tables to give me an exact form. Okay, so now we're going to have a look at doing things using the palette. Um, uh, so I'm just going to drag this over. You can access this from the window menu at the top. Oh no, sorry, from the palettes menu at the top. You've got different palettes that you can access. This is the basic maths assistant. So I just want to show you how to enter definite, indefinite integrals, sums and products using, uh, using the palette. Uh, as you can see, you can, whoops. Uh, as you can see, uh, you can, oops, I accidentally did something wrong there. Oh well. As you can see, you can do all sorts of stuff using the palette. You can do the square roots and the signs and the causes. I'm just going to uh, click over here. This takes me to sums, products, integrals. And the first thing I'm going to do is a sum. So I'll click down this one down here, and it gives me this graphical thing. I click in there, and I type i, the variable, equals 1 to n of i squared. Run that, and I get my nice analytic expression. 
let's try a uh, indefinite integral using using this button here. We're going to take the indefinite integral of x squared with respect to x. Boom, x cubed over 3. I can also do definite integrals. Uh, let's do an integral over the range 1 to 1 of sine of x with respect to x. That comes out as 0. That's no surprise. Uh, what else can I do? I can do a product of i goes from 1 to n of uh, i plus 1. How about that? Uh, there we go, and it comes out as 1 plus n factorial. So it, has, it rec recognizes factorials. I could do 50 factorial and get my, uh, my big answer. Uh, so again, nice analytic expression at the end. Okay, let's have a look at flow control. No programming language is complete without flow control. So we're going to have a look at a few things. Uh, if statements, for loops, and uh, while loops. So we're going to define a function using an if statement. And we're going to use it to evaluate, to implement the step function. So I'm defining a function d, which is the step function, and it says if x, the value that's being passed to the function, if x is greater than or equal to 0, then it returns 1. Otherwise, it returns 0. And so if we evaluate that for 1, it should give us 1. And if we evaluate it for minus 1, it should give us 0. So let's see what it does. Bingo, that's what it does. We can use for loops. So I showed you how to use uh, sums to evaluate uh, things. We can use for loops, and, uh, but they're a bit more powerful. So here I'm going to say a is equal to 0. I'm going to iterate through i starts at 1. So the syntax is very similar to other languages. i starts at 1. i is less than 10. And i increments by 1 each time. And then I'm going to accumulate a by i squared. And then at the end we'll print out a. And there's our sum. Now we're going to do something similar using a while loop. We're going to add up all the numbers i starting at 0 and terminating when the sum exceeds 20 and print the sum at each iteration. So we start off with a equals 0. Uh, our total accumulator is 0. Then we say while a is less than 10, we'll increment a, increment our total by a, and then print the total. So let's run that. And every uh, iteration of the loop, we do a print command. So here are the individual print outcomes, 0, 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 20. Boom, that's, that's, uh, that's the output. So there are lots of other basic flow controls, but the, the most common ones you'll use are if, for, and while. And these are basically operate exactly the same way as other general purpose programming languages that you're probably familiar with. Uh, a really nice thing that's just come out in uh, the most recent uh, editions of Mathematica, it wasn't here for a long time, is interactive graphics. There's a new command called the manipulate command, and it lets us make uh, a graphic that has a slider associated with it. So what we do is we take a normal plot function. Here I'm plotting sine of a times x superimposed with cos of 2 times a of x over the range x equals 0 to 5, but I haven't specified what this variable a is. What I do is I use the manipulate command to specify that a is in the range 0 to 2. And now when I run this function, I'll get this uh, graphic where a is a slider up the top. It can range between 0 and 2, and if I slide it around, I'll, uh, I'll get the graphic being re-evaluated in real time as I slide that around. So we can do really nice interactive classrooms with this kind of thing. But be warned with manipulate, you don't want to call manipulate if this function, the, the plotting function that you're calling, is some really slow, uh, computationally intensive function. Otherwise, every time you drag the mouse a little bit, you'll be sitting there waiting for five minutes for it to update. So for simple things like, uh, like plotting sine and cos curves, it's fine. If you're doing an interactive graphic of some complicated program, it's probably a bad idea. Okay, Mathematica lets us export things into other formats. So I can export figures if I just do a right click. Uh, no, uh, let's go back up to uh, another graphic that I have. I'll, uh, I'll do a right click on that. I can do save graphic as, 
and then I can save it to the desktop as a PDF format or whatever format you want. So we can export graphics nicely for use in scientific papers. Um, the other thing we do is lots of people in my profession use LaTeX, uh, which is a typesetting program uh, for representing mathematical equations and then submitting papers to journals. So what mathematical lets us export equations directly into LaTeX. So what we do is we, uh, we select it, we go to the edit menu, go to copy as LaTeX, and now I'm just going to quickly go and open up a new uh, text document in uh, another window. Here we are. And I'm just going to paste that in. And then you can see that you've got the LaTeX code for that equation. So if you're dealing with really gargantuan complex equations and you can't be bothered to type it in manually in LaTeX, you can use Mathematica's copy as LaTeX uh, function to do that directly. Okay. So we've covered all the basics that I wanted to, uh, to discuss. Now what I'd like to do is uh, do three little projects that nicely uh, make use of the different functionality that we've learned about today. The first little project we're going to do is implementing a classical random walk on a line. So a classical random walk is where you have a, a graph, in this case a linear graph, so a bunch of vertices in a line. We put a particle at the middle of the line and then with some probability p, the walker goes to the left, and with some probability p, he goes to the right. And we're going to repeat that over and over again, and look at the uh, statistical distribution at the output. So here's how we're going to do it. We're going to have a linear graph with n vertices. I'm going to set n is equal to 100. p is the probability that the particle steps to the left, and 1 minus p is the probability that it steps to the right. So I'll set p equals a half, so it's 50-50. Uh, we're going to do a Monte Carlo uh, simulation where we'll repeat this many times over and build up statistics. So I'll let the number of iterations m be 1,000. Now, I'm going to make a table um, called Final Position, and this tabulates uh, the, the final location of the walker after it's, after it's walked through the graph. And we're going to run this over and over again and just accumulate this vector to see how many times it ends up at its, at its finishing position. So initially this table is going to be populated with zeros. So it's populated with zeros for every uh, vertex 1 to n. Now we're going to use our for loop. Uh, iter refers to the iteration number, so the number of iterations goes from 1 to m, incrementing by 1. x is going to be the position of the walker, so it starts off at the middle of the graph. So I've made it the floor of n divided by 2, so it's at the middle of the graph. And then t is time. I'm going to let the walker evolve for n over 2 minus 1 steps. I'm restricting it like this because I don't want the walker to walk off the edge of the graph. So it's at the middle of the graph, so I don't want it to do more than n divided by 2 steps, otherwise it'll walk off the edge. So the time goes from 1 to n divided by 2 minus 1, incrementing by 1. And then I use my if statement. To, uh, random gives us a random number uh, between 0 and 1, a, uh, a, a, a numeric random number between 0 and 1. So I'm going to say if p is greater than random, then x gets incremented by 1, otherwise it gets decremented by 1. So if I repeat this for loop here with the t in it, it'll just go through all of the time steps. Each time we pick a random number, and then depending upon the probability p with that bias, we either step to the left or to the right. At the end of walking around for all of those t time steps, we um, look at where the walker is, which is its position x, we look at that position in the table, and we increment that by 1. So now we've made a mark that says the final position of the walker at position x is now 1 more than what it previously was. And then we go all the way back to the beginning and do another iteration starting from scratch where the walker starts at the middle of the graph again. Finally, we take our distribution and normalize it by the number of iterations so that we get a probability distribution. And then we're going to use the list line plot function to do a histogram of uh, this final position distribution. So I'm just going to run that with Shift Enter. And there's the output statistics to my uh, classical random walk. Um, 
you can see that it's a nice uh, binomial distribution. That's what you expect for a classical random walk. Uh, we, can, we can try playing around with the parameters. So if I make this a biased walk, at the moment it's a 50-50 walk. Let's make it have a probability of 0.9 going in one direction and 0.1 going in the other direction. Run that again and now we get a biased distribution. I could make it the other way around, make it 0.2 of going one direction and 0.8 going the other direction. So we can, uh, we can play around with these parameters, just rerun the program. And that's how you implement a simple classical random walk on a line. This is not the only way to do it. There are actually probably much more efficient ways of doing it than this. But I've chosen to do it this way because it nicely illustrates the flow control and table functions that we've made use of in this tutorial. The next uh, little exercise I'm going to show you is how to define the Fibonacci function. Now, I'm actually going to show you a very inefficient way of doing it, but I'm intentionally doing it this way because I want to demonstrate a, uh, a nice feature of Mathematica, and that is recursive functions. So functions can call themselves. Um, most programming languages have this, and Mathematica has it too. So if you want to calculate the nth Fibonacci number, it's defined as the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers. So the first Fibonacci number is 1, the second Fibonacci number is 1. Those are the only two exceptions. The, the next Fibonacci number is the sum of the previous two, which is 1 plus 1, which is 2. The next one is the sum of the previous two, which is 1 plus 2, which is 3. The next one is the sum of those previous two, which is 3 and 2, which is 5, and so on. So there are many ways you can implement a Fibonacci sequence, but I'm going to do it like this, defining a recursive function called Fib. N is the nth Fibonacci number. Now, if N is less than 2, then by default the Fibonacci number is defined as 1. Okay, so, so those are the only two exceptions. For all other numbers, it's defined as the sum of the previous two numbers, but for the first two, there aren't two previous numbers, so it's just by default set to be equal to 1. So if n is less than 2, it's equal to 1. Otherwise, it's the sum of the n minus 1 and the n minus 2 uh, Fibonacci numbers. So this is a recursive function because it's calling itself. So let's evaluate that function. And we're going to make a table of the first 20 Fibonacci numbers. And here they are, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, and so on. Now, as I said, this is actually a very inefficient way of evaluating uh, the Fibonacci numbers because um, actually um, the, the number of self-referential calls that this function has to make grows exponentially with n. So this is a really bad way of writing Fibonacci numbers but I just wanted to show you that uh, recursive functions can work. And the very last exercise I want to show you is implementing a, uh, a in quantum mechanics implementing the beam splitter transformation. So if you are not familiar with uh, quantum mechanics you can probably switch off right now uh, I'm including this one because it's kind of useful to show how operator algebra can be implemented in quantum mechanics in, uh, in, in Mathematica. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the two-mode Fox state, so uh, two photons in the first mode and two photons in the second mode. We're going to apply a beam splitter to uh, operation to it using the operator Heisenberg evolution operators. Then we're going to convert the output state to a Fox state representation and look at what the probabilities are of measuring the different photon numbers. So here I'm going to use A and B to represent the photon creation operators in the first and second modes. So our input state is defined as the square of the creation operator in A, the square of the creation operator in B, and the uh, root 2 factorial, square root, root 2 factorial functions are are the normalizations that are required when you uh, express Fox states using creation operators. Now I'm going to define a rule, a substitution rule. So this is in the Heisenberg picture in quantum mechanics. Don't worry if you know what, don't know what that means. But basically all we're saying here is that A gets manipulated such that A gets, uh, becomes A plus B over root 2 and B becomes A minus B over root 2. So this is the, uh, the, the rule for a 50-50 beam splitter. I'm going to have another rule uh, which takes a quantum state expressed in operator form and converts it to Schrodinger form. So we take it from an expression written in terms of photon creation operators and convert it to an expression in terms of KETs. And the rule is that 
the creation operator to the power of n becomes the square root of n factorial times the ket in mode a uh, with n photons and b to the power of n becomes at root n factorial ket in mode b with n photons. And notice that I've used this underscore for the n. That's a wild card. Uh, so these are really powerful when you're doing uh, replacement rules. If you use wild cards, it'll mean for any value of n we can do this. So if, I, if a appears with any power, it'll use this substitution rule. So this is a really powerful way to do it. Okay, so we're going to just evaluate all of those. Now I'm going to take our input state, which is represented in, he in Heisenberg form, and I'm going to apply the, to the two Fock rule to it. So this is the beam splitter rule here. Oh, sorry, uh, I'm going to apply the, the two Fock rule here, which converts it to cat form. So here we go. Whoops. Okay, I need to quit my kernel again because I've defined some of these um, parameters previously. Let's try this again. This is the same problem that I mentioned at the start. Okay, input state, two Fock rule. You notice that Mathematica actually recognizes the function ket in this nice uh, graphical way as what a physicist would write as a ket. So it's actually quite nice for doing quantum mechanics stuff. Okay, so our input state, a squared, b squared. With the normalization, we apply the two Fock rule, which represents it in Schrodinger form, and we get a ket in mode A with two photons and a ket in mode B with two photons. Now I'm going to apply the beam splitter rule to the input state, which applies our Heisenberg transformation. Uh, and I'm going to expand it because it's going to have some brackets. And then I'm going to apply the two Fock rule to convert it back to a ket form. So let's do that. This is what I get when I apply the beam splitter rule. The a becomes an a squared, an a minus b squared, the b becomes an a plus b squared. I expand out the brackets and convert it to a, to a Schrodinger form. And now I've got my superposition in terms of kets. So with this amplitude here, I've got four photons in mode A. With this amplitude here, I've got two photons in A and two photons in B. And with this amplitude here, I've got four photons in B. And now what we're going to use is our uh, coefficient function from earlier on to extract these coefficients and work out the probabilities of measuring the different photon number configurations. So the probability of measuring zero photons in A uh, and uh, zero photons in B and four photons in A is the absolute square of uh, the coefficient in front of the ket A4 term in our state output. So this takes our state output, look at the coefficient in front of ket A4, take the absolute square of it, and that's the probability that we measure four photons in A and no photons in B. We can do the same for the other configurations. The probability of measuring two in A and two in B is the coefficient in front of this ket, absolute squared. And the probability of measuring four photons in B is the uh, absolute square of the amplitude of, of that uh, coefficient. So let's run all of those. We get our, our, our probabilities, and just to verify, we can add them all up. They all add up to one. So this is how we can do some simple quantum mechanics um, using mode operators and converting between Schrodinger and Heisenberg pictures and uh, doing some basic calculations uh, using that. So that concludes this tutorial. I hope you've uh, learned something. Mathematica really is a fantastic piece of software and I use it every day for almost everything I do. Uh, gone are the days of integral tables and looking things up in books. It's all just built in and I get everything analytically. I never have to do algebra by hand again. So uh, I hope you've, uh, you've enjoyed this and uh, thank you for listening.